Hi, I'm Sue Cameron. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Lucy Arnaz. Now for those of you in the know, that's probably all of you, know that she's my best friend. So I'm going to try to pretend, not that I don't know her, but I'm going to behave in a professional way. I know she will do the same thing. I just have to say though that her nightclub act is extraordinary. And I truly believe that she's the most talented person of the Arnez family. Seriously, go see her. Okay, now that I've said that, here's Lucy. What was the first lullaby you ever heard? What was the first lullaby? I told you this was gonna be unusual. <laughs> oh, I'll bet it was in Spanish. Yes. So what would it have been? Vaya con Dios. No. <laughs> <laughs> it might've been Quierame Mucho. Oh, that would be no, nice. Mm -hmm. It's not really a lullaby, but kids don't know. No. Um, it's soothing and slow. You know, so that's probably dad singing Quierame Mucho probably, yeah. Oh, what a good question. So that's really, that's, so that's really the first song you ever heard. Just, just FYI, my mother's idea of a lullaby was uh, How Deep Is The Ocean and You Go To My Head, which talks about cocaine. So don't and, Well, you know, the, everybody's idea of a lullaby is the worst one ever. Rock yeah. Rock bye baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the right. bow breaks, the cradle will fall and down will come baby cradle and all. We sang that to our children. What did we Absolutely. Say? Absolutely. Death and destruction from the <laughs> moment of birth. And you wonder what's wrong with the planet. Exactly. Um, that was my lead in question to music. So that sounds like the first musical song. All songs are musical, aren't they? Uh, One would, well, not so much anymore, but yeah, I can, start a, should be. I can start a beat now, but never mind. Uh, so was, <laughs> I don't know that that's as musical as some, how no. deep is the ocean? I'm not sure. It's the then there is always James Brown's syncopated, huh? That's also in music. It can be, it can mm -hmm. be, because you can dance to that. Huh? Okay, uh, so anyway, back to music. Um, what was the next song that really influenced you where music kind of took you away and you fell in love with it? These are hard questions, Sue Cameron. These are oh. really hard questions because I have to think back many, many years. I'm sorry, I'm not asking for a recipe on your cauliflower bake. Oh, well, the, I could do that easier because it's more current. Um, or the Minneapolis pancake. <sighs> What is the first song that influenced me? Oh, you just, mean like- It's just a song that made you love music. Oh my God, I loved it all. You have to understand, my father was a band leader. He had a fantastic orchestra, 16 or 20 people playing mm -hmm. music. And he played all the great American classics, he Broadway show tunes, Latin music. So from the time I was, before I was born, that's what I was listening to. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was just a matter of, you know, translating and understanding words and understanding, because I have no recollection of what the first song was. I have no idea. Were you at those I, rehearsals? Did you ever go to those rehearsals with the band? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, they wasn't rehearsing for the band to go on the road anymore. They were doing I Love Lucy then, right. but the band was playing on that show and I would go down to the set. So I heard it then. I heard the music at home. He had records, you know, he had things that he made, uh, I just, music was so much a part of my life that it's hard for me to say what was the first song that influenced me because it, it's, I don't know what about my life, what would it be like if I, if, if I didn't have music in it? That's a terrifying thought. You know, I think about that sometimes when I think about what happens if art just disappears, like there's no more movies, there's no more music, there's no more paintings, there's no more oh. photography, there's. Absolutely. <sighs> It's, when I, it's did fun. you go after school, when you go home, did you uh, play music? Oh yeah, Put on oh, records? always. Top 40, like when you and I get together and the top 40 comes on and we sing everything along. I mean, I learned yes. every song that was the hit top 40, you know, on Casey Kasem or, you know, I danced on KHJ dance, you know, the Me Ninth too. Street West. I, yes, I was on Ninth Street West. There. Yes, well, that's, right? I had no idea you danced too. I yeah. told you that I, I had I know. Partner, and I won the dance contest right up to the finals. Of course. I loved all that. Who music. beat you? What idiot beat you? Who could do that? 
I don't know. Who remembers? I wonder if they kept those tapes. Somebody, somebody better must have been really good. Right. We were good. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, then, of course, my brother at 10 or 11 years old had Dino, Desi and Billy, a little boys band rock group. And they had a number one song called I'm a Fool. So that could have been, you know, some of the music that, you know, I heard first. Leslie Gore, Paul Peterson, mm -hmm. uh, crazy, crazy B-sides of 45 records. Did you know I was a bridesmaid at Paul Peterson's first wedding? Shut up. I'm serious. No, I had my whole room was post wall to wall Paul. One side oh. was Paul Peterson and the other side was Paul Newman. <laughs> <laughs> well, either or I'd go with uh, Newman. Yeah. Um, and now he's a Facebook friend, Paul Peterson, which yes, is so is. cool. Have you seen his handlebar mustache? You know, he oh. has a handlebar mustache. I'm not oh. fond of that, but he didn't check with me first. No, uh, otherwise we would have shaved that right off. I, I don't know how we got on Paul Peterson, but since we're here. Because music. Yes. She can't find her keys. She pulls out frozen custard, piano bench, pretzels and a monkey wrench, tennis racket, army cot, pumpkin seeds and coffee pot, watermelon gold, post a rabbit's foot and French toast, but she can't find her keys. So that Pineapple influence. princess. There you go. That, yes. you know, raindrops, raindrops falling up. A rich man living in a tent. Four square wheels on an automobile and a pair of pants trying on a man. Very unlikely, isn't it? Most improbable too. But it's just as unlikely that I'll ever fall for anyone else but you. Another B-side of a... <laughs> I just have <laughs> children. There were things called 45s. They were little records yes. like this. They weren't any bigger than this. Yes. And they had a hit tune on one side and a song you never heard of on the other That's side. Right. And I used to love to play the B sides and find out there was any like gold out mm -hmm. there. And there, were, there was. There was all those fun, fun songs. Yes. The B side freak. Yeah, me too. We're not going to go into B sides. I think we should discuss. The was that too much? Was that too much? No, no, no. I, I think they're going to love it. I can, I can hear the click of turning off right now. No, yeah, that's, that's not true. No, there's never been a Zoom interview like this. Um, so, mm -hmm. of the Three Stooges, which was your favorite, Manny Mo or Jack? I didn't like the Three Stooges. They were called Manny Mo and Jack. Larry Mo and Curly Joe. Thank you. And my, my mother did one of their films, but I never liked them. I thought they were stupid. Me I just, too. I the Marx Brothers. Nying, nying, some of the Marx Brothers stuff. Some Three Stooges. They didn't do it for me. I don't know. I why. never liked them. I never I thought they were funny. Them. How Too is stupid. This, how, how, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how that was comedy. But anyway. Yes. Plastic. So back to music. Back um, to music. Yeah. <laughs> you need water. Back to music. <laughs> I know. <laughs> More music. More music okay. questions, please, Alex. Okay. Here comes. Here comes music. I'll take music for one thousand. Thank you very much. From the grave. The question is. What made you want to do a nightclub act? Oh, well, there we go back to my dad again. I, I, wanted, I never thought I wanted to do a nightclub act. Um, I was doing theater, musicals, and I was having a good time doing that, doing television and doing a few films. And then my dad died. And um, part of what I found in his belongings, really, the, literally the night he died, was this little box of cassettes that a fan had given him in San Francisco, a guy from San Francisco, uh, Edward Maffe was his name. And they were little cassettes that Edward Maffe had made of original Desi Arnaz recordings and live radio shows from places like the Rose Room of the Palace Hotel in San Francisco and things like that. I had never heard his band with that kind of stuff because this is 1986. There weren't any Desi Arnaz CDs yet, like there are now, compilations of those original records. Those original records were gone, right? I only knew his music from the I Love Lucy show, whatever little bit of song they would throw in there. I heard some of those, right? That was in my head. But these were half hour shows of his and the most amazing music with the most amazing charts, arrangements of these great songs, Latin songs, American songs, Broadway songs. And I listened to these little cassettes in my car after dad died and his voice was just so full of joy and the arrangements were so happy making. I just, I said, God, I just wanna be on stage with a band that good and the arrangements that cool. And oh, wouldn't that be neat? And that's the first time I ever thought about it. And I never thought, oh, I'm gonna go find out how to do that now. I kind of just thought it and meant it. 
you know what they say, tell the universe what you want, be specific. Right. I guess I was telling the universe exactly what I wanted because within a few months, it came my way. And by 1988, I was doing a nightclub act, uh, 90 minutes of Irving Berlin in hmm. Palermo, Sicily, which I then transferred to the United States and did all around the country. And then I took some of those songs out and put Gershwin in and Cy Coleman in. And next thing I knew, I had a nightclub act and I was playing Vegas and all the other cities. And that was 33 years ago. <laughs> oh, I don't, that was how it started, my right. dad's tapes. And without places like the Purple Room, Thank here, you. here we go. There uh, are so. What does it mean? That you could just tell me what you think the Purple Room means to Palm Springs, music, people. There are whatever. so few places where you can go and hear first class performances of live music. And, that, and that's not to disparage all the wonderful little musicians that are playing around town, you know, nobody listening while somebody's eating and, you know, great piano players and some cool singers who sing to tracks sometimes and all that. But there really is not another place. Forget in the Coachella Valley. There isn't a place like this in Los Angeles. Right where now. You have a class A supper club with award winning, like how many years in a row, best dining experience food bar and then people on stage as you can see like Tommy Toon like Marilyn May like Billy Stritch like you know Shirley Jones the Lainey Kazan go on on and on and on Christine Andreas uh, Anne Hampton Calloway it just Sam Harris he Michael Holmes has brought the cream of the crop best of the best talent to that room since it opened and it never fails it never fails to empower you when you leave, you know? I mean, I think I may have seen one or two acts there that I thought, well, you know, they tried, but it really, but, but it still was better than almost anything else that I see mm -hmm. because they're pros, you know? And it's the only, it's the only place of its kind like it. And I, I love going to places like the Purple Room. They don't exist hardly even in New York anymore. And they're closing all around the country because I guess people stay home and watch Netflix or they give barbecues or something. It's really hard to to uh, to start these clubs, you know, and it's hard to keep them afloat. But he's doing a fantastic job. Before COVID and before the pandemic, Purple Room, you couldn't get a seat most of the time, right? And for the Judy show on Sunday, for Michael's show, the Purple Room, forget about it. Right. It's sold out all the time, and it's one of the most exciting, funny, you know, places to go and things to do. Even if you've seen it, I've seen it like three times. I can't wait to go back and see it again because it's different every time he does it because he goes into the audience and he you know it's, it's never the same show twice and uh it that's, that cannot it cannot not be there it's not going to not be there as no. long as I have breath in my body <laughs> you bet you bet I also think that Michael uh, was hit harder than most people in Palm Springs because it was classified as a theater not a restaurant so he could never really open or he could only open at 10 percent well, uh, he fall. He seemed to follow the rules, which I find great. What do you think about that? That's a hard thing to do, following rules. That's one of the reasons that we have a campaign to make sure that he doesn't uh, fail and that he succeeds at this, because there are a lot of places here that did not follow the rules. We talked about that once before. A lot of places down valley, shall we say, uh, that kind of thumbed their nose at the whole COVID experience and stayed open even when everybody else was closed or opened inside when everybody else was supposed to only be outside. And it was like, yeah, come get me, sue me, who cares? I'm shocked at that when I heard that. Michael said, no, I get it, we can't do this. And plus it's the science of a performer being on stage, singing, using all that breath, you know, and the, what you mm -hmm. expend, the, you know, what you expend within yourself to hit the notes and to do 90 minutes of a show. It's, it's worse for the performer on stage than it is for the audience as far as getting COVID. It's way worse. And that's the science that came out. So all the performing arts places said, we can't put people on the stage and ask them to do that, much less, you know, the audience, of course, they have to, we have to separate them so much. You can barely exist at hundred percent capacity, but he went, okay, that's what we got to do. Then that's what we do. And kept his staff on for months and months and months, paid his waiters his wait staff, his bartenders, and most of them had to move on after a certain point. They would take whatever job they could get, so they left, but his, I think his chef stayed with him, right. and he's taken out every loan that was available. 
mortgaged his entire existence to keep this this place going and he's got rents and all kinds of taxes and stuff but he did it right he did it right and he always does he always does things in the classy best way so you don't you shouldn't be getting punished for doing things right for following the rules didn't he also help you with the mask and gown oh my god when this all started you know as we know the hospitals were really short on the ppe on the personal protective equipment and um one doctor at Eisenhower called me and said, is there any way you can help us? I said, I don't sew. What do you mean? What can I do? And he said, we just need millions of masks. We need gowns. We need stuff done. And I have one woman working on it. It's Shelly. And um, she needs help and she needs promotion and she needs hands. Okay, I do what I can. And I made a couple of calls, uh, Jim Lapidus, John Monahan, and the, the ball started rolling and the word got out to, to uh, Michael Holmes and Jeremy Hobbs at the Purple Room. And they turned their whole club, which wasn't being used as a club, so why not do something tremendous with it? They turned the club into a little factory and brought in you know tables and reams of fabric and uh, disposable gown fabric and started making the masks and the gowns in conjunction with the CV Mask Project. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> What do, it's like, what do you need from me now? So every time something has been needed in, in our little society here, our little social world, Christmas, kids, gifts, you know, he collected them twice as many as he said he was going to, right. wrapped them all, gave them away. He's the guy that says yes. He's the guy that raises his hand and says, well, what can I do? How can I help? So we have to raise our hands now. That's right. And just because we, and thank God, we, we have been raising money beautifully out of the kindness of, of all of these people, but it's not over. Sometimes they look on a website and they go, oh, well, look, they've raised that. Well, I'm here to say that's a beginning. Yeah, well, well it's more than a beginning. We're, we're halfway there and people have been extraordinarily generous. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, um, you know, in the beginning, it's like, well, I'll, I'll give this much and we'll see what other people do and we'll see how fast we get there. And that's great. If as the wonderful Jane Garrison who saved Oswood Canyon, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this incredible canyon they were gonna build 200 homes on down here. Jane had a wonderful way of raising money, which is a really hard thing to do. I'm not good at raising money. I really am not. I hate asking people for money. It's just, it's, life is hard, especially in a pandemic. People are out of work and you know, it's been a rough year. How do you say, oh, come on, give me some money. Really hard. But she said, when she was asking, she said, you know, if you feel moved enough to want to contribute and you want to make make out a check give what you're comfortable giving and then go back and give a little bit more to where you're really not that comfortable <laughs> that's true giving that really struck me wow because that's the difference between really putting yourself out there and doing a little bit more then you think you can get away with. Hmm. And it feels really good when you do it, even though it hurts a little bit like, Ooh, I don't, don't think you. but you just up it. You think that was perfect. And that's what that's well now just top it off a little bit, a little bit more so that you're just a little bit more uncomfortable Then you're really giving. I went on the website and I always look at the donors, right? Cause I'm in, I'm just so inspired by what people do. And yeah, there's some amazing people out there. Uh, David Applegate, who happens to be a friend of mine. I saw that he, he gave $10,000, which amazing. is just, just amazing. Oh, that is so generous and so beautiful. And yet I was incredibly moved also by a donation from somebody for $36. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's incredible because it must have been a very specific allotment you know what I mean? Like yes. I have $36 left over this month from something and I'm going to give it all to them. Or this is, you know, how much I usually spend on my cigarettes and I won't smoke for the next day. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably what they cost now, right. but right. 36, it wasn't 30, it wasn't 35, 36. Mm -hmm. So I thought those are the kind of donations from people all over this area and, and people donated from other States because they know the purple room and lots yes. of, Lots of artists donated because they want to play the Purple Room again. You bet. Yeah. So it's okay if you're moved by this to go on the website and say, look, I, mm, I'm embarrassed. I can't. Or do it anonymously. We don't care what your name is. You know, give 10 bucks. If you can give $1,000, great. 
give what you think you would spend at a fabulous night, Friday or Saturday at the Purple Room, mm -hmm. which you plan to do again, should it stay open, right? Well, Absolutely. it's never going to open again, then, you know, maybe you could afford to just give us this so that it can open again. Mm -hmm. As if it had been open all this time. Here's, I figured out if it had been open all this time and I went twice a month and spent what I usually spend there, well, what would that be? You right. know, and I haven't gone. So I've saved a lot of money basically by not going to a lot of restaurants and not going to the movies and not traveling, not going to the theater. Mm -hmm. Come on, we haven't been, I haven't gotten a paycheck in 14 months, 15 months. And that's okay. So I took a little from the piggy bank and went, you know, mm -hmm. I want that to be here when all of this is done. I want the purple room to be there for me, selfishly. I want it to be there. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. That is actually a perfect note to end on. I'm now going to go write a check for thirty six ninety five. You have to. You always have to like outdo the person, right? So yeah. it's got to be that yeah. the ninety five, not just no. like thirty six ninety five, three thousand six hundred and ninety five dollars. Exactly. Yeah, we'll leave it at three thousand six hundred ninety five dollars. Thank you, thank you for your love and support. Thank you. Oh, are you kidding? Thanks for doing this. Really, my pleasure. Love y'all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>